uh, Diamond Street and make our way to Diamond and Bosworth. So here the Saul looks very familiar. Here's Wilder Street, Chenery Street is down here. Bosworth Street is just behind us. And here is what our district looked like in 1893. This is the earliest image we found of the Glen Park District. And we can see Chenery Street winding its way uh, down from around uh, the Fairmont District, uh, down what today is uh, the, the main village in uh, Glen Park. We see here, remember the the hub on the uh, Jose Noe map from uh, 1856, we see, seem to see that arcing around to the background. But most significantly, and the reason uh, our walk today is named, a trestle ran through it, is this is Diamond Street today between Bosworth and uh, Chenery Street. And this is the San Francisco Electric Railway making its way. Uh, through the district. So, uh, and just to give you a little bit more view here, so this is what we're looking at today, is this stretch of road through the heart of Glen Park. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1893. And of course, the, the trestle is crossing uh, Islas Creek. So here we see the Diamond Street trestle in 1905. We see um, Isla's Creek running through. It looks like there's been some landfill already. Uh, we see both uh, what is today the, the Glen Park Cleaners uh, as well as what today is Tigers. Uh, it used to have a, a third level, the building where Tigers is today, uh, but because of a uh, very bad explosion in the building next to it, um, part of this building was damaged and during the remodel, they opted to remove the third floor. Here we see a trolley car crossing Islas Creek. It looks like matchsticks. I don't know how comfortable I would be running over the trestle at that location. And here we have a view looking north, uh, what the trestle looked like. Here we see it's impassable for vehicles and persons on foot cross at your own risk. Well, I would say so with this big hole right here. This would be the Kern Street Alley here today. And here again, we see the building of the, uh, the uh, Glen Park Cleaners. As we get closer to Diamond and Chenery, uh, we see how the trestle is making the bend um, at Chenery, uh, Diamond and Chenery Streets. Uh, we see the building where Tekka is today, the uh, Witch's Cap building, uh, originally constructed in 1908, brand new in this image, uh, housed a pharmacy at the very uh, beginning as the first uh, uh, business. So here we see a little bit of detail on the Sanborn fire insurance map. Now these maps were used to record uh, structures and the details of structures in the event of a fire so that you know insurance uh, could be determined, insurance coverage uh, following any catastrophe. And this is the earliest uh, fire insurance map we have of our district from 1899 to 1900. And we see here the trestle running across from Diamond Street. Uh, we see here a building um, a couple of doors in from Diamond Street on Chenery, uh, which would be the location of uh, August Straub's Saloon. Um, next to the creek is a, um, a water pump that helped um, produce electricity for the electric railway. And we also see a tannery. We can't forget, there were still many cattle throughout the district. At this point, more cattle than humans. And even as we go over towards uh, the Fairmont area into Noe Valley, many tanneries over there. So it just gives you an idea how many head of cattle were still in the district as we uh, entered the 20th century. And of course, uh, for this building right here, today's Glen Park Cleaners, this is the oldest commercial building we have in the district today. It was constructed by William Hock um, in 1897, uh, noted here to be on the corner of Chinnery and Groton Avenue. 
Now, he would construct the building and open a saloon. And here it's referred to as the Gumtree Saloon. And not long after it opened, it was about nine o'clock in the evening. And he and a few friends were sitting in the saloon playing cards when this masked gunman came in and held them up. No one was injured, but they had to give up all of their money and jewelry. And um, the culprit ran off into the darkness, never to be found. So of course, after the earthquake, uh, with all the folks coming into the neighborhood, Glen Park starts to boom. And we have to rethink about now, you know, this district is being seen as a rural district within the, the, uh, the city of San Francisco. And it's being referred to as the Switzerland of San Francisco. Um, here we see some trees, this is the gum tree grove. Um, thanks to Archibald Baldwin and Glen Park of the Mission Zoo, he really is the one who started tree planting for the district. Uh, Adolph Sutro did not plant trees in our district, um, contrary to common lore that's been passed around through the decades. Uh, his tree line ends on Mount Davidson. And then some of the um, improvement groups and civic organizations uh, that would come uh, in the next few years after this uh, would also continue planting trees. So that's really when the Sylvan aspect of our district began. So here we see from the River Brothers, this is probably right before the earthquake, we see Chinnery Street here, this cottage, um, is in uh, near the baseball diamond uh, or in the corner of the baseball diamond in Glen Canyon Park. We see Martha Hill here. Um, we see the gum tree grove on Chinnery and at least one of these houses is still standing on Chinnery Street. So we see it, you know, when you come to Glen Park, you're moving to the country. Here Glen Park's known as, uh, you know, Glen Park among the pines and it just looks like a very idyllic place to live, but with all of the um, uh, necessary aspects of, you know, civilization still within reach. For instance, the Glen Park School, and as we'll see shortly, a bit of shopping here, uh, again, called a veritable Switzerland. I wish I had a better image of this. This was uh, put out by the predecessor to uh, the Glen Park News, the Glen Park Perspective, and also the Continental Savings Bank that used to sit at the corner of um, Bosworth and Diamond where the Dig Dignity Health Clinic is today. Um, I think there's a lot of detail in here that's important, but unfortunately um, the image itself is not very good quality. So here's the back side of that image. Here we see all of the home lots for sale in the, what's called the Castro Street edition. So anything west of Castro, this way is considered the Castro Street edition. And then here we see Glen Park Terrace, Surrey Street, uh, now Chinnery Street, and Diamond Street uh, as originally laid out by Archibald Baldwin. But in, in addition to all of these other lots, many that have been newly released um, by the Crocker Estate and uh, who was running the private Glen Park in the Mission Zoo. So with this influx of new people, of course, the Improvement Association was started, the Glen Park Improvement Association. Uh, I think unlike all other improvement associations up to that time was co-educational. Here by 1910, they've already made quite a name for themselves. We see Theodore Penther and our uh, saloon keeper, August Straub, who were co-founders of the Glen Park Improvement Association, uh, and uh, Penther would serve as the first president. And then his wife would go on to make quite a name for herself. Um, she, I believe, would co-found what became known as the Glen Park Outdoor Art League, uh, along with Mrs. Evers, who also lived in the district on Chilton and Chinnery. Uh, and this was a woman's civic club um, modeled after the Mill Valley Outdoor Art Club in Mill Valley, still active today. Um, and they were very active along with the Glen Park Improvement Association in bringing the needed infrastructure to Glen Park. The city itself was focusing on rebuilding downtown San Francisco. So these new little suburbia uh, 
neighborhoods that were beginning to crop up all over the city had to fight very hard, pretty much tooth and nail, just to get the basic essentials like water and gas and electricity and sewage. Um, and so uh, the Glen Park women, uh, along with the Glen Park Improvement Association made frequent trips down to the Board of Supervisors demanding that, you know, this infrastructure be in place. Um, at that time, Islas Creek was being used as the sewer, so there was no water supply, and a water wagon had to come through the neighborhood every day, and people had to go to the wagon, get a couple of pails of water. That was their water supply for the day. Uh, but through the efforts of the Improvement Association and uh, the Glen Park Outdoor Art League, slowly things became uh, more readily available and more sanitary. Uh, also, they helped found Glen Park's first volunteer fire department, which was on uh, Upper Diamond Street near Moreland. Um, and they, uh, the Glen Park women also founded Glen Park's first library, uh, in 1908, uh, which was originally housed in a dry goods store on the block where the Glen Park BART station sits today. So very long history of our local library. But even with all of that, our Glen Park ladies would make history by leading uh, what we believe is the first suffrage march in the United States. Uh, along with the California Equal Suffrage Association. We see our own Mrs. Pinther here, who hand sewed and embroidered this beautiful banner. It's likely the first use of a banner in a suffrage parade in the United States. This is her daughter-in-law, Jeanette Pinther. And here we have Lillian Harris Coffin, a major suffragist who lived in Mill Valley. And they are co-leading a suffrage march in Oakland. Uh, to the Republican State Convention in August of 1908 to encourage the men to add suffrage to the plank. Unfortunately, um, they failed that day. The men did not add suffrage, though they would the following year. But from our research, uh, we do believe this is the very first suffrage march in the United States. And if you'd like to learn more about it, you can go to the YouTube page of the California Historical Society, and you can view a presentation that I recorded there that talks all about the history of what we believe is a very significant event that is not yet recognized in American history. Here are the ladies at Chenery and Diamond in 1908. We don't know if they're leaving for the march. Um, here, uh, it seems to be a few months before that because this is the grocery, the Gallagher grocery that actually uh, exploded unexpectedly one night that damaged uh, what is now the Tigers restaurant building. Um, but here we see still, you know, the roads are not improved. We see the electric rail rail railway tracks rounding the bend. And here is that location today. So certainly, quite a change from uh, 112 years ago. So on, uh, just to go back just there, here is Tiger's Restaurant today. That was originally the site of the Dismeyer's Saloon. Here we see them in 1906, and he was at the location uh, until the 1920s. And also just up the round, uh, uh, around the bend, so if we just go up Diamond Street, and just as it begins to veer left, uh, we see uh, the Glen Odeon that Mrs. Evers, who had been president of the Glen Park Outdoor Art League, uh, ran this movie theater in Glen Park. Um, and she was the proprietor from about 1914 to about 1926 uh, when it closed. Um, if you'd ever been in the old Aardvark bookstore on Church Street that recently closed for good, um, you would have seen what the interior of these uh, early Nickelodeons and movie theaters looked like. Um, but apparently um, the, um, the, the movie screen was on the opposite side of this wall. There was seating going back, and they also apparently had the actual Nickelodeons where you would put your nickel in and look through the viewing piece. 
So now we're looking eastward uh, at Diamond and Chinnery. Here we see Le Petit Laurent, Buddies, uh, Teca, which is where um, the, uh, the building built in 1908 that originally housed a pharmacy, and Glen Park Hardware. And when we look at the fire insurance map from 1905, we see that the structures that include uh, today's hardware store and the other buildings, except for the Chinnery Park restaurant uh, that run up Chinnery Street here, we see the creek that had come down Diamond Street Hill merging into Isla's Creek. So just before the earthquake, not quite all filled yet, Here's Hawk's Saloon, the Dismeyer Saloon. And here's the, the image of that map uh, from 1905. Very grainy, unfortunately. Uh, but here we see the Glen Park Dry Cleaners building. Uh, and one of these buildings, I think it might be this one, is the hardware store today, one of these two. It's very hard to say without seeing the detail. Here we see, um, what originally began as the electric railway about to make the bend onto Bosworth Street. Uh, so definitely, and the gum tree grove here. So definitely a much different look and feel than what we have today. The Teets family home uh, was constructed and is actually viewable in the trussel image from 1893. Uh, this is the oldest structure that we have in Glen Park. Uh, what I've been able to determine in research is that this was originally constructed apparently as a cow shed in the 1870s and later converted into a home. And uh, the Teets family has been living uh, in the home throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, and here, uh, next to Burden Beckett Books, uh, the Teets family home is behind the fence and the redwood tree. So. Again, the, this is the oldest structure in Glen Park today. In terms of retail shopping during the time of our ladies with the Glen Park Improvement Association, uh, things had started to spring up. We see a whole list of essentials uh, that could be had without going too far. Uh, There's a lot of walking in those days. Of course, getting over to 30th Street, they could take the electric well, railway. Uh, here we see uh, the location of the Good Brothers Dairy, um, but you didn't have to go very far to get almost everything that you needed. Here we have uh, August Straub, one of our co-founders of the Glen Park Improvement Association in 1923, um, still trying to sort exactly which uh, site on Chinnery Street this structure is. Um, this note here says it was later a pharmacy, um, but it, it things haven't teased out quite uh, right yet, so still looking into that. But what's interesting is that this is during Prohibition, and here he is selling liquor, uh, though in directories at the time, you know, he's selling uh, refreshments and soft drinks. Um, but we see the sign for Budweiser here. Well, apparently in San Francisco, the San Francisco Police Department pretty much turned a blind eye. Uh, so as long as uh, folks didn't get too out of control in these saloons, um, there was still liquor being dispensed. Um, however, the feds did come in uh, at one point on Wilder Street, there was the Pacific ba uh, uh, Basket Factory uh, that had a still. And so that was raided at one point and the folks arrested. And there was also on Bosworth Street, an ice cream shop that uh, one day some uh, customers were passing out from fumes. And it turned out there was a still in the basement uh, that the ice cream maker claimed he didn't know about. Uh, so certainly there was lots of activity of uh, uh, distiller, distillation happening uh, in our district during Prohibition. So here, uh, the fire insurance map from 1915, I've actually put two maps together. And we see now uh, a decade after the earthquake, things are really starting to fill out along Chinnery Street and on Diamond Street, uh, Surrey, 
and Sussex, though, again, as we head out west uh, along Chinnery towards Glen Canyon Park, we see things are uh, still, there's uh, still some land available uh, for the construction of homes. And here over here, we see the Glen Park School. So as we advance to 1928, here we're looking south along Diamond Street. This is Chinnery. Again, the Glen Park Cleaners that uh, would become a five and dime store. Uh, we see also here uh, what used to be Dismeyer Saloon is now a drugstore, a pharmacy. It was run by the same pharmacist for uh, half a century. And I just happened to come across uh, this uh, booklet. This is the cover of a booklet uh, from the Glen Park Pharmacy uh, sold by a guy in Georgia. How it ever ended up there, I have no idea. Um, and here it's hawking, you know, that uh, generally the inhabitants of the jungle are not nervous. It's the complicated life of civilization that develops nerves, um, which kind of harkens true today. Um, and so here we can take Dr. Miles Nervine, an uh, in effervescent or liquid, and, uh, you know, quiets the nerves. So uh, I hope it worked for those folks back then. Moving along, uh, Diamond and Chenery in 1940, we see the 10 Monterey car coming around. It's right this time that all rail service to the district ended. Uh, not only street level, but the Southern Pacific as well, uh, ended pass passenger service in 1940 and ended altogether in 1942. And here, uh, after the rails have been removed, we see uh, Glen Park Village uh, in 1942, uh, a grocery where Buddy's is today, uh, a bakery where Tekka is today, uh, a grocery also where the hardware store is, and here at uh, where Le Petit Laurent is, a, a, a dentist upstairs. And here's the district today. So we are now going to move to our last stop. Here we are at Bosworth. Here is uh, August Straub's uh, building that he constructed in 1912 with the Corner Market and uh, Viking Subs. The, the BART station, and we're going to go down to the entrance of the BART Street parking lot, look back to the west and southwest. And, you know, this idea of a hub kind of continues, as I mentioned earlier, throughout the decades. And in 1948, there was a wild freeway plan uh, developed for San Francisco. And everything that you see in red here are new freeways that were to improve transportation throughout the city. And we're going to focus in here on uh, the heart of the city where we're located. And we can see that right along Bosworth Street uh, through Glen Canyon Park, which was now a recreation area, uh, and uh, along O'Shaughnessy uh, was going to be what was called the Circumferential Expressway. And it was to, at one point, uh, plan to tunnel under Portola, come up again at 7th Avenue, tunnel under Golden Gate Park, and make its way along um, the, the Presidio to Golden Gate Bridge. So it was basically uh, going to be a shortcut to the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was going to bisect our neighborhood. So here is, uh, in 1948, what our district looked like. Here we see the 30th Street tree line into Glen Canyon, Palms Road, um, the completed O'Shaughnessy Boulevard. Um, this is the baseball area and the Glen Park Rec Center right here. Here is Diamond Street and still undeveloped area of gold mine, Red Rock and Fairmont Hills that within another 20 years would be completed as Diamond Heights. So they felt that, you know, with plans for a new uh, uh, highway to run through the Southern Freeway, which would become Interstate 280, that this shortcut uh, through Glen Park and through Glen Canyon would make its way to uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. So of course, Glen Park residents weren't too happy about it. 
And here we have Minnie Straw Baxter, who is the daughter of August Straub. Here she's sitting in the second floor window above the corner market at Bosworth and Diamond. And she's holding tickets that she is selling, or not selling, uh, giving out to um, a protest meeting to be held at the Glen Park School uh, that was to hold um, uh, 500 uh, local residents who were not happy with this plan. She even went to the California State Legislature and was able to successfully prevent uh, the construction of the freeway through Glen Park. Now, part of that plan was going to include the widening of Bosworth, and of course, that would happen by the 1960s. Uh, but by 1965, the idea is back again. Uh, Bosworth is being widened, and they wanted to run the freeway right over the recreation area in Glen Park. So then enter what uh, uh, three women who became known as the Gumtree Girls, including Zoanne Nordstrom, Joan Seiwald, and the late Jerry Arkush. And uh, the way Nor uh, Zoanne likes to tell it is that she was walking in Glen Canyon one day with her toddler and saw a man uh, digging a post hole. And she went up to him and said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, this is for the new freeway that's coming through here. And she said, the hell it is. And so she went back home and uh, got together with the two other ladies. And they formed the Save Glen Park Committee, uh, which then uh, through several assaults into the early 1970s, uh, were able to save Glen Canyon from freeways. But that wasn't the end of Glen Park being known as a hub. Here we have um, also proposed uh, initially in 1948 Bay Area Rapid Transit, uh, claiming the current Bay Area rail system had been inadequate. And they wanted to unify the entire Bay Area uh, with this new uh, modern, at the time, transit system. So here we have uh, one of the early maps of proposed routes. And Clearly, BART had big plans for going throughout the city. Of course, the only one that really came to be is this one through uh, here, Bosworth or Glen Park in Ocean Ave. And of course, now it extends further south. So here are some images of the dig here on the left. This is the block where the BART station sits currently. It was where the Bank of America was housed in addition to the Glen Park Library building at the time. Uh, and you can see as they're building the tunnel here, uh, tunneling right through the district. Um, several images here looking in the area of the Glen Park BART station. And finally, uh, by 1972, the uh, BART station itself had been constructed. This is a uh, modern brutalist design, according to architectural historians. And the building is so significant that it was recently placed on the National Register of Historic Places. So here, again, we see this idea of a hub. We have the Glen Park BART Station. We have Diamond and Bosworth, the entrance to what today is Interstate 280. Uh, we have Alamany and the uh, San Jose uh, crossing coming in. So definitely a very, very busy district that kind of uh, was uh, alluded to in this map uh, from Jose Noe in 1856. So that is a very fast ramble uh, through uh, uh, the early days of Glen Park Village. And I thank everyone for hanging in there for this and I'm happy to take on any questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Jim. He said, holy cow. Wow, thank you. Evelyn, I'm just gonna remind people that if they do wanna ask a question, they should type it into the chat box so that everyone can see it. Yes, thank you.
why didn't Nobel choose Glen Canyon as the site for his dynamite invention? Um, he never came to California. It really was because of the connections um, that Julius Bandman, who was a merchant here in San Francisco, his brother was in Paris, and so uh, who was also the brother in Paris was an associate of Alfred Nobel. So it's kind of through that connection uh, that it came to be. But Nobel himself never came west. He did visit uh, New York, New Jersey, but he never uh, went anywhere beyond that in the United States. Any other questions? Uh, you reference a book early in the tour. What was the name of that book? Ah, about the dynamite factory, perhaps. Um, that book um, is the history of explosives in the United States. Um, it was written by two gentlemen. Um, one was, I think, Shatler, um, written in 1927, and it explores the history of explosives the explosives industry throughout the United States up to that point. So if you would like to email glenparkhistory at gmail.com and I can forward you the, the details for that book. Um, it's available online, so it should be easy to access. Evelyn, you also mentioned a book about the Alone. I don't know which one this person was thinking Oh, about. yes, uh, that was uh, called, thank you. That was the Alone Way. And that was written by uh, the author Margolin uh, in 1978, uh, readily available still. It's quite a popular little book locally. And um, he does a nice job trying to imagine what the Ohlone lifestyle um, you know, might have been. Um, let's see, what was the House of Refuge? Um, that was, if you're referring to a map, uh, that I believe would be at the site of today's uh, City College. And as one might imagine, it would be a place where those who were uh, less fortunate may not have had their home uh, or you know, may have been unable to um, live independently uh, lived. Um, and so I, I think that's might be what you're referring to. And then there was also the Alms House, uh, the site of today's um, Laguna Honda Hospital on Laguna Honda Boulevard, uh, again, where uh, the disadvantaged and those who are unable to care for themselves, um, you know, perhaps with disabilities were cared for. Uh, is a Baldwin map the earliest map of Glen Park? Uh, no, actually not. There were several maps uh, prior to that, um, that show some of our early streets, I, I showed a few of them today, dating back to, uh, you know, as late as the Coast Survey maps that started coming out in 1859, 1860, uh, though, of course, there was no development in our district, so basically, you know, there is just the landscape on the map. Um, there are other maps that show imaginary streets. Um, a lot of times maps were developed because people had a vision of what a district should look like or how they wanted to lay the district out. And the problem with those is that they were all in gridiron fashion at 90 degree angles. And with the tortuous landscape of our district, um, 90 degrees wasn't gonna work. So that's why a lot of those plans weren't developed. Um, Evelyn, Let's see. you um, skipped over one question, which was why ah. were the Tree Girls so successful against uh, against the time saving freeway? Against saving, why were they successful saving the freeway? I would say between them and also Minnie Straw Baxter, it was just determination and motivation. Um, the, these women were in the faces of both city and state government officials who wanted to push the freeway through. Uh, before we had social media, they used every method available to them between phone calls and handwriting letters and mimeographing sheets to distribute and going door to door, uh, writing letters to public officials, attending public official meetings. Um, they were quite successful 
uh, garnering the support through, not only within Glen Park, but throughout the city, uh, because this attack was happening in other, in other neighborhoods throughout the city as well, of you know forcing a freeway through a district. And through all of those efforts, um, they were able to stall every attempt to bring a freeway through the di district. So it's just their hard work uh, that got it done. Uh, let's see. Why did they decide to tear down the trestle? And why wasn't the train route left there with the village growing around it? Uh, I think it was just the, the times, you know, that um, uh, buses hadn't quite arrived yet, but they were about to, those newfangled diesel buses that were supposed to be the answer for everything. Um, a lot of the um, railways, the Southern Pacific, uh, pretty much was shut down uh, for the war effort. Um, and that's why passengers uh, were no longer riding after 1940. It was being used to transport materials. Uh, and the engines were just being redistributed to other areas in the country where uh, the military effort uh, needed to be supported. Uh, in terms of the street railways, I think, again, it was a matter of modernization of looking ahead and thinking that, uh, you know, buses were the better answer. And, uh, you know, one wonders about that today. If we still had these uh, uh, rail lines through the district, how much more efficient that would be than buses. Um, is the line of trees that you're calling 30th Street planning still there? And yes, it is. If you are walking along uh, the dirt road in Glen Canyon, originally called Alms Tree Road, and now known as Gumtree Girls Trail, and as you go north of the Recreation Center and you have the eastern slope to your right, you approach a line of trees going up the hill on your right. And those trees begin at the site of the Glen Ridge Cooperative School. So that is the 30th Street tree line. Uh, is Isla's Creek visible anywhere today? Um, and is the rock still there? Isla's Creek uh, still runs above ground north of the Recreation Center. It uh, was run underground at that location around 1920. Uh, where it now runs in a culvert underground following its natural route over to the bay. Uh, but north of um, the rec center up to about Ruth uh, uh, Azawa uh, High School near Portola, the creek still runs above ground. Now it's not the creek that it used to be because of development in the area blocking tributaries a lot of silt is collected in the creek based on redevelopment. Uh, it's a trickle of its former self, but if you walk along uh, Glen Canyon, uh, you'll see uh, Islas Creek, even in summer months. It's, it's there, it's not very much of it, but the best time to see it is after we've had a big rain. Um, and is the rock still there? Sadly, no. Um, the rock, would have been located right about where the BART station and the J Church Muni stop are. Um, so it would have been right around in that location. And um, it appeared on maps through the 19th century. Uh, but I think as um, the railroads, uh, San Jose Avenue was expanded to accommodate car traffic in the 1920s, um, as that made its way around the bend. At some point, um, the rock disappeared. I don't know if it was when the uh, Southern Freeway, Interstate 280 was constructed, uh, or if it was earlier, but uh, no, it doesn't exist anymore. So that might be the last question. Um, again, thank you everybody for sitting with us today and for learning the history of uh, Glen Park Village. I know we've gone way over our allotted time, but I thank you very much for hanging in there with me. Um, if you want more information, again, please visit our website at www.glenparkhistory.org. And if you have specific questions, uh, you can email me at glenparkhistory at gmail.com. So thanks everyone and stay safe and well. <laughs>